This is Mac Geek Gab, episode 698 for Monday, February 26th, 2018. Good readings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. It takes your questions, tips, cool stuff found. We put it all in. We mix it all together into a stew. We share answers. We share tips. We share all the, all the stuff. And the goal is for each and every one of us, yes, me included, John included, you included, learns at least five new things each and every time we come together. Sponsors for this episode include Other World Computing, who are shipping their new Thunderbolt, Thunder Bay 4, Thunderbolt 3 external drives. We'll talk about that and more shortly here, here in uh, snowy, rainy, slushy Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in just plain yucky Fairfield, Connecticut, <laughs> weather-wise, yucky. Right. Uh, this is John F. Brown. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's Sunday morning. We're recording this a day early, schedules and all that crazy stuff being what they are. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know. Whatever. It's fine. My studio is, I actually can't, I couldn't tell you from being in here. I mean, I'm aware of what time of day it is because I was outside and I have short-term memory still and that's all good. But um, for my studio is totally enclosed. I couldn't tell you what's going on outside. I can barely hear things outside and I certainly can't see. So we're just here. We're doing our thing like we always do. That's how it works. Let's, um, let's jump into some quick tips, shall we, Mr. Braun? That work sure. for you? All right, cool. Uh, jumping to Martin related to show 697, he says, when discussing, discussing option X to skip the message delete confirmation, pilot Pete mentioned that he preferred keyboard shortcuts, but disliked that the enter key on the confirmation box defaulted to cancel a workaround for this is to enable full keyboard access in system preferences, keyboard shortcuts, and then under full keyboard access, change the radio buttons to all controls. Now, when the dialog appears, you can use the space bar to select the option, which is outlined in blue or the enter key to choose the option, which is filled blue tabbing to the desired option and hitting space bar also works. Yeah. I I've always turned that on. This is one of those things This is why we uh, sort of concocted the concept of a quick tip, because it's these things that we do all the time and take for granted that we forget about. And full keyboard access is most definitely one of them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's cool. Huh? Or at I'm least it was for me. That is that new for you? Or is yours already set up that way? No, on both my machines, it's set up as text boxes and lists only, which yeah. I guess is the default. Yeah. It's nice being able to tab through all that. It really gives you like, I mean, like the option says full keyboard access. You can really kind of move around and tab through things. And I recommend turning it on and, and playing with it. It'll change a little bit about, how you interact with dialog boxes, but it might make you more efficient. It keeps me from having to jump to the mouse all the time, which is sort of the key um, or the point. The goal. What is it, John? I don't know. Hey, uh, you know, Eric wrote us, John, and he says, I have some insight into the uh, issue that JT had with Launchpad. Uh, JT wrote us last week and, asked if uh, with a geek challenge, if we knew with high Sierra, how to get the launch pad to alphabetize the way that it used to. And, uh, and JT tried to tell us, but we were too thick that morning to, or that afternoon to, to process it properly. But JT tried to tell us that he thought this was APFS. And I thought, well, that's crazy. Why would it be APFS? Well, in fact it is. And then Eric and to his credit, JT, um, tried to explain this to us. There's a thread on stack exchange about this that in particular says with high Sierra, most, if not all of the flash based storage had their file system upgraded from APFS to HFS uh, for to APFS from HFS plus um, calling read R E A D D I R on a directory in APFS returns file names in hash order. Whereas HFS plus returns file names in lexicograph lexicographical order. Um, so the defaults trick to reorganize Launchpad based on this still works, 
but on HFS plus discs in High Sierra, it will work as expected. And on APFS formatted discs, you see that it resets the order to something that is seemingly random, but most likely the order of the hashed name of the uh, of the application. So blame APFS is actually the right answer on that one. It seems like we're blaming APFS for a lot, John. Oh, it's uh, you ain't seen nothing yet so uh, wait until later in the show. Okay, yeah, that might be the uh, the theme of this episode, but uh, it seems like that's the theme of a lot of episodes lately. So anyway, we'll keep moving with the tips and and come back around. We'll, AP, we're not done with you yet, APFS. All right, um, <laughs> let's see. So Taryn writes and says. Uh, Thanks for the show. I was listening to the recent episode where you were discussing the various benefits of different options for installing windows on a Mac. One reason not to use boot camp is because then you have to have virus scan and back it up just like a PC, because in fact, it is no different than a PC. It just happens to be an Apple branded piece of hardware running it. He says, I have used parallels to install a virtual PC for years. I have a few programs that still work in Windows, and I have always had an old MS Office license for Windows and installed that as well, because why not? My backup routine is to take frequent time machine backups and periodical super duper image to a drive in an enclosure that I can boot to if something goes wrong. Well, something went wrong, and I had to operate on my bootable image for a few weeks while I waited for a replacement. Everything worked great except... Microsoft Office for Mac knew that it was installed on a new SSD, and when I tried to open it, it prompted me to re-enter the key. Unfortunately, I was then on a business trip and did not have a record of the key with me. I tried opening the Parallels Windows 7 virtual machine, and presto, MS Office for Windows did not even know anything had changed. The other benefits of running the virtual machine not in boot camp are that the Mac native virus protection prevents infection of the root. And time machine backups see the entire machine as just another file. So if you have a problem, you can just roll back to a point where it was working and off you go. Uh, he says, P.S. Now, if I buy software, the first thing I do is copy the key into my password manager of choice. So that's smart. Um, yeah, this is interesting, right? Because with uh, obviously, as he pointed out, with boot camp moving to a new drive, the the system is aware that a new drive is there. Drives have, I don't want to call them serial numbers, but they're unique IDs, right, John? And, uh, and systems know when things change and windows is very, very temperamental with that, especially with licenses and all of the, uh, the stuff that you sort of have to deal with there. Whereas with parallels, windows thinks it's running on a one specific parallels computer. That is just that container then you can move that container to any computer anywhere and run it. And windows will still still see it as the same parallels computer, which is sort of interesting uh, in terms of, of, you know, how things have to go. And that that's where virtualization really comes into play. Like in the enterprise, because you can have all your servers running virtualized. And if you need faster hardware, you just take the virtualized container and put it on faster hardware, bigger hardware, more RAM, whatever, and boom, it's there. You don't have to rebuild anything. The the OS just follows you along, which is kind of cool. Any thoughts on that, John? I think we uh, we probably do that for uh, Mac Observer, right? We do indeed. We didn't used to, and um, and we wound up living with you know old hardware for a really long time because the con the 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 time it takes to move and rebuild an entire OS uh, is a pain in the neck. But yeah, once we virtualize now, I mean, we still, we're going to need to do some kind of upgrades because we, we do, you know, Linux gets old, but, um, but not nearly as quickly as hardware gets old. So in the past, I think we actually had physical equipment uh, hosted somewhere, right? Probably, hopefully not like in your basement or something. <laughs> no, never in my basement. Uh, well, the only thing we ever hosted here was our own FileMaker server um, for a little while. But I, even that wasn't good because anytime internet or power would go out here, nobody else could get to our FileMaker server. And that's kind of how we run things. So uh, so we host that elsewhere now, too. I think uh, I don't want to say we're the wrong company. I think it's FileMakerHosting.com. We just moved. Yeah, FileMakerHostingService.com. I believe is who we are with. Right. Um, but the uh, advantage being is that you hope that they have a UPS and, uh, and 
things like that so that they don't go down. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they've been, they've actually been pretty good. So, uh, we just moved to them in what, December, I think. So, but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, but it, our servers actually hosted down in Virginia and uh, our servers, I should say, are hosted down in Virginia, but, but yeah, the whole virtualized thing is great for that. And, and handy as Taryn points out for exactly this kind of thing where, especially if, you know, you're doing something where your needs don't change all that quickly. You know, for those of us Mac users that wind up using Windows, it's generally for a very specific purpose, like one thing or maybe, maybe two things. And if your environment isn't constantly changing, like it is on your main desktop machine where you're doing all sorts of stuff, um, being able to sort of take that with you as you upgrade Macs and do things without being forced to say, you know, rebuild windows or upgrade windows and all that stuff is, um, is pretty handy and pretty efficient. It's a, it's not a bad way to live. Not a bad way. Moving on to John, John, is that right? Not John, John, moving on to John comma, John question mark is, is I think you understood anyway. Uh, Chuck Mark. Yes. Chuck Mark. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, John says, uh, he says, has anyone come up? Well, first he asked if anybody had come up with a solution about the problem that we reported on 697 with James, where he was having a, a problem unlocking his Mac with his Apple watch. And uh, John wrote us back before we were able to answer, which is good because we didn't have this answer that uh, he says, I fixed my problem. It says, I had forgotten that both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi need to be on in order for your Apple Watch to unlock your iMac. It's not just a Bluetooth thing. It's Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are required for that. So that's one thing with Apple Watch unlocks. We have, I believe we have three, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the second comes from Alicia, who wrote in and... Uh, and said, the problem is not the Mac, it's the watch. You need to wipe and restore the watch from iCloud or from its backup, which is actually on your phone, and the watch will work perfectly to unlock the Mac. She says that uh, she's been through it a couple of times, and it will work perfectly until it doesn't, and then you have to sort of go through this process again. So something about iCloud or, or perhaps the restore that, that fixes this. So thanks, Alicia. And then... Um, Dominic, John, which might lead us right into our questions. Uh, Dominic writes, he says, uh, this may help with James problem with Apple watch unlock that you discussed. He says, I had so little success with my Apple watch unlock on my 2014 Mac mini that I gave it up. I gave up on it sometime later doing something unrelated that required me to fire up. I stumbler on the mini. I noticed that the signal to noise ratio on my 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi was only about 12 dB usable, but much worse than I expected with a base station, maybe a dozen feet away through one wall coming in at an RSSI of negative 65 dB. The signal to noise ratio on five gigahertz, which the Mac mini was actually connected with, was fine, but the watch uses 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi for unlocking to cut a long story short an external white box USB three SSD enclosure uh, was the culprit emitting an uncomfortable level of interference that got in the way of 2.4 gigahertz using a good quality USB cables for everything connecting directly to the mini and moving the SSD enclosure away from the back of the machine where the Wi-Fi antenna are to a few feet away beyond a USB three bridge increased the 2.4 gigahertz signal to noise to a much more respectable 36 dB and has allowed the watch to unlock uh, my Mac flawlessly ever since. He said, I stumbler might not be required for diagnosis, though it's convenient. Uh, you could use the option click on the menu bar Wi-Fi icon to see. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is that classic problem, John, right? Where USB 3 and 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi fight with each other, right? Yes, and... Uh we're actually uh, bringing it up right now. We're actually going to link to a little ditty that Intel, I think Intel wrote it up because I think Intel is probably makes a USB 3 chips. <laughs> right, right. So they have a white paper that kind of goes into uh, 
some detail about why this is happening. I think it's basically because 2.4 is close enough or a harmonic of five gigahertz. Yep. In that, in that, in a nutshell, I think that's that's why why you see it happen. So, but actually, a good tip to look up the uh, SNR or signal to noise ratio. That's uh, that's actually a pretty clever way of identifying the problem. Nice work. Yeah, I like. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that 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 way, um, you can see it. Right. It's it's one thing to just look at the symptom in this case, the Apple watch unlocking it, but being able to see the actual readings that can, uh, it's super helpful for troubleshooting. Like you said, so oh look at that. You beat me to it. I beat. uh, Yeah. 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 We have our, we all work together on putting our, our show notes together as we, uh, as we create the show, shout out to everybody in the chat room at Mac com slash stream where, uh, where we all help. It's a, it's a team effort for sure. So pretty good stuff. Yeah, good, John. Let's yes. uh, let's stay on this USB three interference and and things like that, and let's go to Peer. Um, Peer wrote in and said, "I just replaced my twenty seven inch iMac twenty twelve with a brand new top of the line uh, iMac." He said, "When it came with the new Bluetooth keyboard and trackpad, uh, I have a very strange issue that occurs every time I connect my iPhone ten with a cable to do an iMazing backup locally. The Bluetooth becomes unresponsive." and disconnects both the keyboard and the trackpad. Sometimes it even comes with Bluetooth status unavailable after about one minute. My solution is to have an old wired mouse connected so I can wake it up again. Where do I start? Yeah, this is, uh, I would think this is the same thing that you are connecting. Uh, I guess, it, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I never thought about the iPhone being a USB three, but, uh, but I suppose it is now, right? Uh, is it? I don't know. I mean, this certainly, so if it's that, then the solution is to move it away from your Bluetooth keyboard. So, uh, you know, and, and your iMac in general. So maybe a longer USB cable, maybe somewhere else. If it's not, um, it could be something about the iMac itself, right? Where perhaps, you know, you, um, USB and Bluetooth are actually related inside your computer in that the internal Bluetooth chip is wired into your USB bus. And you can see this. If you go into system profiler, hardware, USB, you'll see Bluetooth USB controller listed right in there. Mm. And if it's not this interference thing, I'd be curious what happens if you open up system profiler to that screen make sure you see it now plug your iphone in now refresh that screen you can either do it with command r or if your keyboard's not working and you just have the wired mouse connected um go to file and refresh information in system profiler which is also command r to uh to get it to redraw that screen see if the bluetooth usb host controller still is there it's possible that maybe there's and, and this is you know, probably an oversimplification. So forgive me, but maybe there's too much data, you know, being as the data is being backed up across the bus, maybe it's doing something to interfere with Bluetooth. The good news is if you move to a different USB port on your Mac, you might be able to jump to something that's on a different USB bus and perhaps that wouldn't get in the way, but I, I don't know. So there you go. Um, I'm curious if you have your uh, your iPhone 10 with you. I do. There's a quick way we could find out. It, uh, do, you, do you have a machine that's running iMazing? Um, no, but oh. uh, I mean, not this you, machine. Yeah, this uh, in the studio. No, no I don't have bummer. it here. Yeah, and I don't. Think I'm just noticing I have a here cable either. Because uh, when I look here, so my iPhone, um, if you click on the info button in iMazing Mini, it tells you everything you ever wanted to know about the phone. And I'm looking in at least mine, the iPhone eight, it says, Oh, by the way, your USB interface speed is 480 megabits per second. That's so USB at least two. the iPhone eight that I have is a USB two huh. speed. Huh? I don't know if they kicked it. I was trying to, I couldn't find anything really definitive. Yeah. Well you, and you can see that are you, now you're seeing that in iMazing or you're seeing that in system profiler. I, iMazing uh, gives you a summary uh, of all the aspects of the device that it's uh, 
that it's backing up. Right. Right. I think it gives, yeah, it gives more than, um, way more than the uh, system profiler. Huh. Well, the system profiler would say that too, right? I mean, it would say for the device up to, you know, 12 megabits a second, you know, I'm seeing that on like my keyboards and the Bluetooth one gets 12. I think the mouse gets 1.5 or whatever. So, uh, yeah, if I had a, uh, I had a lightning cable here. I would, I would happily test that. But John, it seems like in my, in my moving things about in the studio, I don't have a lightning cable up here, so I can't do that right now. So, but that's well, how you would check. You, you, but you could query. Uh, what I'm saying is that you can use, uh, uh, I'm using mini and, and get the profile of the device wirelessly. You don't need to plug a cable in. Oh yeah. But plugging the cable in would be very oh, well, that absolutely. Yeah. 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 You can see it then. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I yeah, I had never uh, thought of that. That an iPhone could be uh, causing the interference. Any USB three device, right? I thought it's not just hard drives, right? I th- for some reason I thought it was, but I guess there's no reason. Well, the frequency of USB three is the same no matter it what. It just so. doesn't, yeah. Whether it's an SSD or yeah, 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 yeah. Well, fascinating, John. Um, all right. Well, we'll move on, but we will we will check that. We will check that. Uh, we had a an interesting tip. Or not an interesting tip. I guess they're all interesting. In the chat room this morning, we were talking about Google Drive, and you noted, John, in the pre-show, that Google Drive, the app, but not the service, the app is going away and is being replaced by two things. One of two things. One is for um, personal accounts, which is what most of us are probably using. Uh, It's being replaced by something called Backup and Sync. And uh, if you're a G Suite customer, so on the enterprise side, it's being replaced by something called Google Drive File Stream. So you'll have to, if you use those apps uh, alongside your Google Drive stuff, you'll have to replace the app. Uh, There was some discussion in the chat room, some very passionate discussion that Google's apps aren't all that great for this stuff. Um, I wouldn't know. I don't use them. I use Google Drive all the time. I just use the web interface on my Mac. And then on my Synology, I run uh, cloud, was it cloud file sync, I want to say. And it logs into my Google Drive and my Dropbox and downloads everything from there and safely tucks it away on my Synology. So I have backup copies of all that good stuff. But you use Google Drive, right, John? Yeah. And the reason I I know that this was happening is because... um, a lot of things, when they phone home or check for updates, may not do it on a regular basis, but I found a lot of times uh, when I do a restart, a lot of things that I didn't know were updated will come up, like software updates. Totally. But like a day ago, what happened is that I got a dialogue saying Google Drive for Mac slash PC is going away soon. And then it says, do you want to do something about it? Do you want to install Drive file stream or learn more or not now? So that's how I... Hmm. Otherwise, I w- wouldn't have even thought of it. I, I like it that. Got the, deprecated, and then and then I'd be sad. I mean, yeah, you'd be sad. So how do you collaborate? We, tell me, th- this is interesting, though. I, I, well, first of all, the the sort of sidebar tip here is that rebooting your Mac has lots of benefits. I I, I certainly don't recommend rebooting every day. Uh, you know, like I like to say, we're not running Windows here. Um, but I do find that rebooting once a week. If I don't reboot once a week, even though I have 32 gigs of RAM on on the machines that I use daily, uh, after about a week, things start to get funny. And a reboot really, really solves that. Um, But more frequently than that, generally is not necessary that I find. Um, So that's the sidebar tip is that rebooting your Mac can be great, especially for the reason that you just mentioned, John, because it relaunches all of those sort of background apps or menu bar apps, whatever you want to call them. And they phone home when they, when they launch for the first time and we'll tell you if there's updates. So that's super handy. Um, so that's that yeah. first tip. And I think pretty much the same happens if you log out. I guess that's but true. Rest- yeah. I think for the most part, it'll restart. Maybe not everything that gets restarted uh, or reloaded when you do a restart, but I think some level of that is happening if you do a logout. So yeah, I like that. And I wonder, you know, I should try that the next time that things seem a little wonky, and I decide, oh yeah, a reboot will fix this. 
I should try just logging out and logging back in to see how much of a difference that makes versus reboot. I will, I will do that. I will, I will take one for the team and do that. But I, I wanted the, the conversation I wanted to have John is, so we both use Google drive. It is the thing that we use amongst ourselves here to organize the uh, question queue and agenda for the show. And then uh, you folks in the chat room that want to participate with us and help us with links and things like that uh, actively during the show. And of course we also use Google drive for that, but I've never run the Google drive app on my Mac. I always just go to drive.google.com and that's how I do it. So what do you, how do you do that, John? I think you have a different workflow, right? Well, yeah. So I run the Google drive app and then what I get is a, uh, a Google drive folder in my, uh, in my sidebar. And, and I go to that and I double click on the G doc file and then it launches it. So I'm taking a different path to get to the same place. So it, when you click on, so you have a folder that's kind of like a Dropbox folder, it, right? I mean, it's Correct. just, okay. And when you double click on that file, it launches your default web browser. Is that right? Yes. Huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. So it maps a G doc. To, so I think buried within that is the URL of the, sure uh. of the document. Let me see where is it. Yeah, so it's in my home folder. So when you install the Google Drive client, it puts a folder called Google Drive in in your home folder, and then that's where all the and then there's a Mac Geek Gab subfolder in there, sure. which is you know shared, um, or you shared it, or I shared it, or somebody shared it. Right. Yeah. Either one of us owns it and then shares it with the other. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That, I guess I I never I, like this is uh, I had no idea that you could use Google Drive that way to be perfectly honest. That's great. No, I just I just like having and, and same with Dropbox. So we also have a Dropbox icon in my. Uh, oh in sure, bar. yeah, right, right, huh? Just having you know all the virtual drives in one place. Mm-hmm. Um, it may be redundant because I mean they're in the menu bar as well, but. Yeah, see, I don't have it. I mean, I have Dropbox in the menu bar. I don't have uh, Google Drive in the menu bar. I'm just not running that app. Um, what I do, though, is I use a lot of things in Google Drive. And so I have a lot of shared folders with a lot of different people. And it can get a little bit crazy. But Google Drive has this cool thing called starring something, right? Where you can, like, just right next to the title when you're editing, you can star a document. And then when you go to drive.google.com, you can l click on a list of your starred items. And then you can have that list sorted, say, by, you know, last modification date. And that makes life really easy to get to the things that you're sort of most frequently working on. So what I do, because I use Google Drive a lot and because I don't have it in my finder, is I have a pinned tab in Safari on all of my Macs. That goes directly to the URL for the starred folder in my Google Drive. So I can just go there and you can star other folders in addition to other files. And it's very easy to, you know, unstar them and star them. We, we create a separate agenda file for every episode. So we have, we haven't been doing Google Drive since, since the beginning. So we don't have 700 or whatever, or 699, because we have next week's already going at this point. But, um, but, you know, we've pr probably got several hundred of them out there and, uh, and so the starred ones always just sort of float to the top because, because I have it sorted by last modified. So different workflows. Yeah. That's pretty good, man. Pretty good. Anything else on that before we, uh, before we move on and moving on do whatever we do. Okay. Hey, I, I want to take a quick minute and thank all of our premium subscribers that, uh, whose contributions came in this week, either because they, initiated manual contributions with new subscriptions or direct just one-time donations or uh, the automatically recurring renewals of those subscriptions. So on the biannual $25 every six month plan, thanking West G Jurgen G no relation. I don't think <laughs> Michael E Stuart M Michael C Kirshen S Mark R Fernando M Alan C and John L. Thank you to all of you. And then on the monthly $10 plan, this week came in renewals from Clive S., Dave G., Nick S., no relation to Clive, 
and Ev the Nerd. So thanks to all of you. We, uh, I say it every week, and I mean it. Just because I say it all the time doesn't mean it means any less. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. So thank you very, very much. It means, it means the world. So, um, I had a question this week, John, from uh, someone who wanted to become a consulting client of mine, but I think I gave her a better answer. She has an iMac, I believe a 2013 iMac, and the hinge has stopped holding its position. It's constantly aiming down, all the way down. And there, this is a known problem. Uh, the good it, news... Oh, you can, you can change the angle of the screen. You can't change right. the angle of the screen. Well, you well, can't. Well, you can. And as soon as you let go of it on hers, it flops back down to, fa you know, facing not flat down, but as far down as the, the, you know, the stand will let it go. So it stops, it stops holding it, its position. And that's oh, kind of lame. Yeah. Uh, and oh, she had an easy fix. Well, the, you, you, okay. But I'll hear right? yours first. Sure. Well, she, she came to me and she said, so I know that Apple will fix this for me. But, um, and, and they'll pay for the fix. She said, but, uh, but I don't want to have to bring my computer into them. You know, I, I'd rather somebody like come to my house and take it and do it or whatever. And I said, well, I, I could come and do it. A I'm not authorized Apple. So Apple wouldn't probably wouldn't, you know, reimburse you for my time. Um, I certainly could come to your house and take it into the, the Apple store for you where they would at least cover the cost of the repair. Um, I said, but, you know, it's a big job, right? Taking an iMac apart because the hinge is all the way on the back and you basically have to take everything out of the iMac in order to get there to replace this, this part. So better to have, you know, Apple do that kind of thing, I think, especially if they're willing to pay for it. But she doesn't want to carry her computer anywhere and I can understand that. So I looked around a little bit and Clever people have come up with solutions. So one person on the iFixit board suggested an adjustable rubber cane tip that you wedge in there and you can set to the height that you want, uh, height for the cane, and boom, there it is. Or a thing called the Mac Hack at themachack.com is built to solve exactly this problem. <laughs> and uh, it clips on and you just adjust it and tighten it down when you get it where you want it. And it holds it right there. It's very, very ingenious. And uh, so there you go. And, and as uh, Alex is pointing out in our chat room, Apple care will, at least in some circumstances, uh, do pickup for free. Uh, so Maybe that's the right answer. And I will, I had no idea that they would do that. I knew they used to do that with laptops. I didn't realize they'd do it with an iMac. Um, so. Huh? I, I was going to mention that because when I, when I got my phone repaired, when I got the screen repaired, yeah. um, I preferred to bring it in and wait an hour, but the, they also offer, they're like, well, by the way, if you want to mail it to us, we'll, we'll do that too. Sure. Charge I didn't know the they'd do that with an iMac. Huh? That's great. Well, I'm, always save your boxes. <laughs> This is why you save the box. <laughs> so you, you could mail it back to them. Yeah. Yeah. They may give you a prepaid shipping label. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 So, but, but you final, had, you had a, a solution or a thought. Yes. Dave, it's, it's the tool that we all use to solve the problem of anything that moves when it shouldn't. Duct tape. Yes. <laughs> Just put a piece of tape between the screen and the base. That should, should hold it. It'd, be, it'd have to be a lot of, you'd have to put like a roll of tape in there. No, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean, like essentially that's what the adjustable rubber cane tip solution is, right? right that's right. what any of these are. It's like, yeah, all right. So it's not holding. Guess what? If you don't want to hold it with your hand, use something else instead of your hand. Yeah, it's okay. It's clever, clever. But it is a known issue. So if you're having this problem i think it's 2012 to 2014 imax are the ones that uh that had this this rash uh, of bad I, hinges so you know i think i had one and i think the mechanism i think i had it with a one of my early it was a power mac actually okay like 12 inch had a problem and i think the the mechanism is called the clutch and the thing is it gets loosey-goosey and yeah so my screen would like fall down yeah yeah when i didn't want it to it, at some point it just got but there was no resistance. It wouldn't stay where you put it. Got it. Which, uh, I guess it's happening here. Now, again, I could have done the duct tape solution, but I'm like, I can't work like this. Right. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, the nice part about the duct tape solution on an iMac is uh, when you, at least when you're working on it, you definitely won't see the uh, whatever solution you've implemented because it's on the back. But but if your computer's out in a way where everybody sees the back, then maybe you want something a little more elegant or maybe you want to have Apple actually do the fix. So there you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? We have... Well, we have some more problems with APFS, as we promised. John, I want to take a minute, though, quick and talk about our first sponsor, which is Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. As I mentioned in the uh, pre-show or in the pre-roll or whatever we call that, their new Thunder Bay 4 is the thing that I was talking about after we got back from CES. And really, I'm blown away with what this thing is. I never really understood it before. This is a four bay uh, box that you put discs into and then your Mac manages the raid of it. It's Thunderbolt connected to your Mac. Your Mac manages the raid. And I always thought software versus hardware, hardware raid better and the more I learn, the more I realize, no, 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 <laughs> especially not on the Mac, because all this RAID functionality is is built or the, the stuff that matters for speed is actually built right into the CPUs. And so Apple's own RAID is great. But when you go with an OWC thing, well, now you get to start talking about soft RAID. And that's really, really magical stuff. And you can do some great things with it. It. It's way more efficient than a hardware rate, especially when it comes to recovering from, uh, you know, any kind of inconsistency problem, either a new drive being put in or even just, uh, you know, a, a faulty shutdown or, or an improper shutdown, I should say, that that requires a, a rescan. It, it knows what was happening because the OS is tied, right? The OS and software aid can talk to each other. Um, at that level where hardware raid cannot. So it sort of knows what was happening and what it needs to recover from, as opposed to having to guess and being stuck doing a lot of recovery uh, that isn't necessary. So it, plus this is just a cool box and it can, you can put up to 48 terabytes of stuff in it. Uh, it'll go, they've tested it past 1500 megabytes per second. And this is OWC's Thunder Bay 4. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. In addition to that, you know, OWC, they're the place we go for RAM, for, you know, external hard drives, all that stuff. And I know you go there too, because we just trust them because they've, they've, they've proven worthy of that trust to all of us, not just because they're a sponsor, but because they make good stuff and they stand behind it. So we're very happy to have them on board as a sponsor. Really great company, really great stuff. And they really are my first stop for this kind of thing. So check them out, maxsales.com. And our thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Um, yeah, it's time to complain about APFS again. It's time. It's not us complaining yet. It's, uh, it's Bruce who says, over the past week, I've experienced some problems with an external bus-powered SSD that's running APFS. I know. It's APFS. Quick synopsis. The drive is a 256 gig Apple SSD that was removed from my 2013 Mac Pro and installed in an OWC Envoy enclosure that uh, was part of the drive upgrade kit provided by OWC when I replaced and upgraded the drive. During my recent upgrade on the Mac Pro uh, from the original OWC Aura 1 terabyte SSD to the new Aura Pro SSD 2 terabyte, I ended up installing High Sierra on the external, allowing it to update to a APFS, then using it as a boot volume to allow me to do the firmware update that was necessary for the Mac Pro to install High Sierra. I then installed High Sierra on the new internal two terabyte and stuck the external drive into my camera bag. While visiting my brother in Florida over the last two weeks, I took a bunch of photos and used Capture One Pro 12 on my MacBook Pro to edit them and then copied the process JPEGs onto the external SSD so that I could give them to my brother. At some point, the external SSD just disappeared. Uh, I could plug it into either USB 3 port on my MacBook Pro and the drive light on the enclosure would come on, but it would not show up in the finder. It didn't even show up in disk utility. 
I tried using his MacBook Pro, but got the same result. I ended up using a spare flash card as the transfer medium. I'm running the latest build of High Sierra on my MacBook Pro uh, and on my Mac Pro. When I got home this afternoon, I tried connecting the drive to my Mac Pro. Lo and behold, it appears on the desktop. Here's where my question begins. I ran disk utility on the drive. Everything was fine. When I ran disk utility on the APFS volume, everything was fine. However, when I ran the utility on the container, I got an error that says, warning, over allocation detected on main device at a specific bitmap address. But then it comes out and says, volume appears to be okay. Storage system check. Exit code is zero, which is okay. Have you seen this error before? He says, I'll probably give OWC a call when I get back into the office. But I had heard that Carbon Copy Cloner folks had pulled support for APFS in sparse bundled disk images due to problems with the file system not recognizing that overallocation had occurred. I don't know if this is at all related, but I thought it might be. So I don't have the magic answer here, John, but um, I certainly haven't heard of this overallocation thing before on anything related to physical disks, certainly on the sparse bundles like we talked about and like Bruce mentioned. But um, the fact that the Mac Pro is the only one that sees it is also disturbing, although I feel like that might be a power thing, although it shouldn't be. Um, that exit code of zero, which says it's okay after it reports the error. I, I, I like, I just, I keep coming back to, you know, external drives are, are seen differently than internal drives. Uh, like things like smart can't be done by, at least not by the file system uh, or by Mac OS on external drives. There are other drivers that you can install to do that, but like they're not seen the same way. And I'm wondering if our, if we're going to find that at least in the current short term, our APFS advice sort of keeps ratcheting back from okay on SSDs everywhere, just not rotational drives to okay only on internal SSDs and don't mess with it. Now, I realize in this case, like High Sierra was the thing that upgraded this while it was an external drive. This isn't like somebody going and doing an end around or something. I don't, I don't know. What do you think? I think I just had an event that um, may figure into this. Okay. Well, I got a, another scary warning from, um, so one thing I reformatted my, um, you know, per ProSoft's advice when they said, you know, you have consistency errors and um, FSCK underscore APFS said the same thing and it gave me, you know, an error code. Um, actually, that's one tip. If you run that from the command line, um, it'll explain what these numbers mean, but zero is almost always a good number. <laughs> but um, now I got this error. Critical error. System stability is at risk. Disk 1 S1 is critically low on free space. I'm like, what? And I looked at my disk and I think it did show that I had no free space. And it's like, uh, last I checked, I had about 400 gigs. So what's going on here? I restarted it. Everything was fine. But, huh. I don't know why. Again, I'm having my doubts about um, APFS. Now, it could be because, you know, I insisted on doing this on... Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. This was my internal drive it was reporting on. Really? Which um, is a valid... Is a... a critical problem is that if you have no space left on your yeah that's uh, bad boot drive your system drive uh, the system will probably go crashing <laughs> into the night but um no i got this report that i had almost no free space left and it's like yes i do huh so i guess what i think is i should report that to him too and but you said you looked and it it definitely has like like it was correct there was no free space like the finder agreed with that or no no wait no let me think about it no okay i'm sorry no i misremembered i think i have a snap no it did show yeah about 400 so the thing is a uh, drive genius and or apfs at some point or drive pulse made yep. the determination that i have critically little free space left and you know the device was is you know disc one s1 is my main partition, which has uh, plenty of space. I mean, I got a one terabyte drive in here. Again, about 400 gigs free. Huh. That's, um, yeah. All right. 
Okay. But I decided to re- the other thing is every now and then I'll get into a state where my applications won't launch. Well, first, uh, this has happened a couple of times. Um, I won't see the icon for any of my apps. It's just a generic like document icon. And then any app that I try to launch crashes immediately. And once I'm in this state, it's, it's game over. I, I got to restart to uh, recover from this. Huh. No, I, I may want to consider, I'm wondering if I should go, <laughs> we should go back to um, HFS Plus. Well, let's see, I'm not, true. I'm not having Cause, cause, any issues. I only have APFS on internal Apple provided drives, right? Am I saying that? Am I correct about that? Yes, yes, yes. So I have it on three machines mm-hmm. and they're all app, you know, factory SSDs, no issues. Um, now, I mean, that's only three out of, you know, millions that are running it, but we also aren't hearing from a lot of people, but is your SSD, I mean, again, you know, start getting into like tinfoil hat territory. If we say that, well, non Apple SSDs, cause there's, there's not really much difference there. Um, other than maybe trim support. Right. But um, is your SSD that, that it's running on inside your Mac, is that an Apple SSD or a, a third-party one that you put in there? Now, both my machines I upgraded. Hmm. Yeah, so both my MacBook Pro and my Mini, I took out the crummy uh, rotational drive that it came with, right. and uh, both machines now are running, uh, I believe it's a c- crucial, crucial one right? terabyte yeah. SSD. Yeah. Like the M5-something series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and crucial. Yeah. I mean, their SSDs are great. We've We've had like killer results with them. So I'm not ready to say, I'm definitely not ready to say that third party SSDs are a problem uh, with APFS. We need more data, right? Yeah. But like external drives with APFS, regardless of whether they're rotational or or SSD, uh, you know, maybe we need more data on that too, but, but Mm -hmm. that's sort of the point of where we are here. So, you know, here we are, APFS, it's been in production for almost a year, right? Because it came out with iOS 10.3 or whatever that was almost a year ago. Um, and then obviously with High Sierra now. So, but that's, it's still really young for a file system. So I, I think, I, I think my advice stays stays the same. I'm curious if you feel the same way, John, but mine will be, only use it on SSDs. I think it's okay whether they're internal or external at this point. Um, but especially because of how much question there is, because we just don't have enough experience with problems, backup stuff like crazy. And don't feel like you have to migrate to this. Um, a lot of our tests show that HFS, HFS plus in many instances especially real world instances is, is still faster. So APFS is still being iterated upon by Apple. They're still improving it. Um, And more importantly, we're learning more and more every day about how to troubleshoot and diagnose these things. So, uh, you know, five years from now, we're going to know a lot more than we do today. Kind of like this reminds me of when fusion drive came out, right. Where we were, like, whoa, don't touch it. Don't use it. Like, we don't know anything about it. And then, of course, now we look back. That was, what, six years ago? We look back and say, ah, actually, you know, we, we can count on, like, one hand the number of people that have had, you know, catastrophic failures because of the fusion drive. Otherwise, it's been really good. So, what do you think about APFS, John? I, I have mixed feelings. <laughs> but, well, okay, so, what, like, what's your, your elevator advice to people, right? Use it. Don't use it. Where do you use it? Is it match mine? You have your own. Well, just because I've personally experienced, uh, you know, various strange errors. Yeah. So actually, they've only been two. So the one is it reporting consistency errors when I honestly don't think there was one. Right. And two, this you know weird you're out of usable space panic thing. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> So I'll I'll stick with it. I mean I'll I'll take one for the team. But um, all my drives um, that I use are APFS right now. That can be so. Huh. 
I, 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 including your external drive? Yes. Oh, interesting. I told you, I'm being yeah, stubborn. I'm like, I know. I'm, yeah. It's like, it says I can do it, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I like the idea, like using APFS for an external drive is, is great, right? Because especially if it's the drive that you're cloning your internal drive to and using it for other things, because you don't have to, like when you decide on, on quote unquote partition sizes, it's very fluid with APFS. It's just one blob of storage that things get sort of barfed to and you can set quotas and, and that sort of thing, but you don't. You're not stuck with physical limitations of where those partitions are. So while that's sort of, you know, bad for rotational drives because physically carving it out makes things more efficient with an SSD, it's like, it's a, it's a antiquated way of thinking. So I really like it for that. I haven't done it yet, mind you, but I really like it for that. So, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. John, I, I have to, um, are we, we should be done with APFS for now. Um, but, uh, I but have it's not done with us. It's not done with us. No, no, we're not finished. I mean, we're finished with APFS discussions for this yes. episode. Right. Um, I, I have to, I have to make a confession to you, uh, in, in our audience about something that I did for, uh, actually a client here in, in my neighborhood. Um, they have uh, husband and wife. They have two Macs between them. Well, let's say two Macs, two iPhones, and two iPads. I think that's actually right. Um, they might not both have iPads, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and their goal is to simplify everything and have their pictures everywhere, and also at least one local copy of their pictures backed up. Right, and they. Um, they're technically astute people, but they don't want to be, they don't want to be forced to be nerds. Like they can, if I sit down and explain anything to them, they totally get it, but it doesn't mean they like it. <laughs> you know, they just want it to work. And I grok that. So thinking about this, I was like, well, really what I want is one iCloud photo library between the two of you and then your own iCloud accounts for syncing your own contacts and your own calendars and all of that. Like one iCloud photo, they're really okay with seeing each other's pictures in their camera library. Like it, it's, we had a long conversation about, is that cool? And that's actually how they had been doing things, but they didn't quite understand why it was set up the way it was set up. And so I did something that I have completely advised against because it really seemed like the right thing. Um, but I'm, I'm open to having, to being told that I'm wrong. <laughs> which is also the other reason that I'm sharing this here. So we left, but the, the problem is that you can have multiple iCloud accounts on all set up on all of your Apple devices, but the one that will sync with iCloud photo library must be the main iCloud account. So that's what I did. I set them up with the same main iCloud account on all of their devices. And then on uh, for each of their, and I turned off mail and contacts and calendars and notes and all of those things I left backup on because on the iOS devices, because why not? But, uh, you know, reminders and Safari and all of that stuff, uh, turned off. And then with the secondary iCloud account, uh, you can turn on some of those things. And so I did, and that's where they get their, they don't use iCloud for mail, uh, which made life simpler. Thank goodness. But, uh, but, you know, they do for their contacts and their calendars and that sort of thing. And so we, we let that, that sink that way. But, um, I, you know, it, I, like, I felt like there, this was not necessarily the right thing, but I didn't know of a better option. It would be nice to be able to tell photos to just sync separately, but Apple hasn't really solved that problem for family libraries that way so so that's what i did and uh and i just wanted to uh to share so and and as alex said uh he asked to summarize the goal the goal was to have all photos on all devices and then one of those devices is a new macbook pro that has a 
a 500 gig SSD of which they were using all of about 30 gigs or something. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, 500 gig SSD. They, they were using all of about 30 gigs. And so that one I set to download originals because their photo libraries, uh, I think it's just shy of a hundred gigs. Um, so it downloads originals and then that one backs up to their locally to their time capsule. So that everything's good, but, but that way they all have, they both have all of their photos without having to think about it. So did I, it would, like, what do you think, John? Did I do the wrong thing for these people? Did I lead them astray? I don't think I did, but I, I no, don't as, like as the answer. As, as long as you help them understand your reasoning, which it, Sounds like you did. Totally. Yes. Yes. I made sure they understood that this was like, this is not how this is supposed to work. I would, I never advise people to do this, but here's why. And they were like, yeah, okay. That totally makes sense. We understand the caveats. We understand the risks. Um, and I did tell them, I said the day may come with, you know, OS 10.14 or OS 10.15 where iCloud is, you know, expanded further and further and uses some other service where you're like, oh, that's really bad and we can't extract that. So now we need to do so. And they're happy. So as Cletus says, if so, then congrats. So, yeah, there you go. I think that's the uh, that. And that's really what it comes down to, right, is do what's best for the customer. Don't do what's best for your setup. So anyway, that's uh that's where I came down with that. Shall we move on, John? Any more thoughts on that? No. I mean, I finally saw the light and got more iCloud storage. And yeah, I got my phone. I got lots of RAM. So, yep. Yeah. So, wait. Um, why are you, I, I'm, I'm missing the correlation between RAM and iCloud storage. Well, I, I finally... You know, it was kind of by accident, but once I did it, I'm like, oh, you know, this isn't so bad after all. But um, no, I needed to, uh, you know, I up my plan so I could store all my photos in iCloud. Right. And then, you know, with my most recent device here, I wanted to make sure I got it with, uh... the only downside was that at one point with my older phone, which didn't have as much storage, at some point it came and said, well, you know, it's not enough, man. I'm like, oh, oh, right, right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there you go. Cool. All right, um, let's go to Douglas here. And Douglas asks, I have a new 27-inch 5K iMac. I originally set it up using Migration Assistant from a clone of my old iMac. I've decided I want to nuke the 5K and start with a new clean install and then start adding apps as I need them. My goal in this is to get rid of all that old cruft that may be lingering from the years of updates of my old iMac. I would like to know the best way to go about this. I was thinking of making a clone of my current 5K on an external drive, running a copy of the High Sierra or including a copy of the High Sierra installer, then boot my 5K from the clone, format the 5Ks with disk utility, and then run the OS installer, selecting the 5K as the destination. 5K has a fusion drive, so is there anything special I need to do when formatting it, or will disk utility handle it? Or is there a better way? Yeah, so um, first of all, yeah, disk utility will totally handle your fusion drive, no matter how you do things, it's, it's going to see that that's what it is. It's a, it's an Apple construct. It's an Apple utility. It's going to be fine in most cases, obviously a clone or two <laughs> is a good place to start. Um, but I would say if internet speed or bandwidth caps aren't an issue, I would do your clones and then disconnect them from your Mac. And then I would use the recovery mode method, uh, boot into recovery mode, command R. Uh, and that we means there's no risk of inheriting anything from your clone. Your fusion drive will very much be a part of the process. And recovery mode gives you a great way to boot from that separate recovery partition. It will download the latest installer from Apple that will install high Sierra for you. And it will be the freshest, cleanest install uh, that, that you can have and really is kind of headache free. That's, that's my thought on that. Um, what do you think, John? That was going on in the back of my mind as well. It's, okay. Uh, recovery. I'm trying to remember. I think once you start recovery, I think you can actually see the sub build. No, maybe not. No, I think you can see that. No, never mind. 
But yeah, you, you're right. You you get absolutely the, the latest version, which I've done that on occasion when I've had problems with a machine and they seem like they're not going away. Right. Like, well, just just lay down a new copy of the OS, and by the way, it's it's a it's a newer one, so it actually may uh, there's a good chance it may fix. Uh, fix right. The since yeah. We've so- seen some early installs um, didn't always go smoothly. Right, right. Versions so there's, of the installer. There's two things we're talking about here, right? With Douglas, he would boot to recovery mode, and then from within recovery mode, he'd run disk utility and erase the drive. It's going to seem weird, but it's only going to let you erase the the partition that you aren't the non recovery partition, like your your full data partition, and then you would go and install and and be good to go. That's that's the clean install way. Uh, what you're talking about, John, is the, the sort of the troubleshooting way of laying a new copy of the OS down in place without removing anything else from the drive and your data and your apps and all that stay intact. And and you can do that simply just don't erase the drive first in recovery mode, just lay down a new copy of the OS, just reinstall. And that that can be a great. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That's good, man. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think I, like, I, again, you, you know, it, it's bandwidth dependent because it's going to go download several gigs of data for you in this process, but there you go. So, yeah. Anything else on that before we move on to Putch's question, John? Moving on. Moving on. Putch says, uh, fellas, um, I migrated my Mac pros account to my iMac. But looking at the advanced settings of my iMac, so uh, for, he's looking at the advanced settings of his user account on his iMac, which is done by going to system preferences, users and groups, and then uh, right click or uh, control click, I think. Oh, you got to undo the lock first. I'm doing this in real time with you all to make sure I get it right. So undo the lock on users and groups, then right click on the account that you want to look at and choose advanced options. And uh, and he points out that the account name, which is the short username and the home directory name are called Putch Mac Pro. But it's on his iMac and it's because he migrated this account over. So it inherited the account name and the home directory name, which must be the same. But he says, I don't want it to be called Putch Mac Pro. I want to change it so that it doesn't have this inherited name that came over. Uh, Can I change the account name and home directory without screwing everything up? Or if I change the account name and reboot, will it rename the home directory for me? I hesitate to do anything without asking first. Yeah. So this is one of those things that's totally doable, totally okay to do. And if you do it the wrong way, you will head into a world of hurt. So, I, I, right, right. Um, Apple actually has a support article about this, which is I actually found impressive. I, um, you know, this seems like one of those things that Apple might want to not advise users to do at all. <laughs> but, but it really is like oh, totally okay to do. So we will link to the support article. It's called change the name of your Mac OS user account and home folder. Um, and if it, so, there's two names in there. There's the account name, which is the really important one. And, and that's also sometimes called the short username, although it doesn't have to be shorter than, than the full name, the full name, like on my computers, my account name is Dave. My home directory name is Dave. It's all lowercase. My full name is Dave Hamilton. So, um, it's it, it, the the first thing on this uh, knowledge base article, whatever we call it, support page, is about changing the full username. But that's not what Putch wants to do, and that's not the dangerous part. Um, he wants to change the account name and the home folder name, and it does point out that they need to be the same always when the account's in use. So you can't start doing this on your active account. What you have to do is if you don't already have a test account that's an admin account on your machine, create one. You want one of these on every computer you manage, I think. 
because if something happens to the user account, it's really nice to have a test account that you can log into that's an admin account and relatively clean. So um, create one of those. Then log out of your main user account, log into that one. The first thing you do is go to the users folder and rename the actual folder to be what you want things to be. So if in this case it's Putch Mac Pro and he wants to name it, change it to Putch, fine, rename the folder. Then go into users and groups, go into advanced and uh, change the account name to match the new folder name and change the home directory name to the new folder name. Shouldn't have any spaces or anything like that. It's all got to be just straight. Um, once you've changed these things, save it, restart your Mac and you're good to go. The, the knowledge base article walks through all that. So you don't have to remember the steps. Just remember the concept of you have to do this to a non-active account and it's not going to do anything for you. So there's three things you need to change. You need to change the account name and the home directory name in user, users and groups. And then you actually need to go and rename the home directory to be what you want it to be. It's not going to be, there's no built-in check and balance in macOS that says, ah, if you change the account name, you must have meant to, so that you also wanted to change these other two things. I got you. No, it doesn't got you. you it, you'll, you'll, you'll get caught is what will get happen. And that's, that's bad. So don't get caught. That's, that's my advice. Well, even say as much. So in red letters in that dialogue, it says warning, changing these settings might damage the account, prevent the user from logging in, which is both hilarious and <laughs> no, it's not hilarious. No, not well, hilarious. depending on who it happens to, but um, right. Oh, Ari points out a great thing on this screen. Um, he says, instead of typing in the home directory name where you might get it wrong, hit the choose button. There's a choose dot, dot, dot there where you can go and navigate it, you know, to in a file dialogue to the folder. And that way you're choosing it and there's no question it'll get it right because the folder exists and you you've chosen it. So that that's a uh, that's smart. That's that's advice from uh, a gentleman who probably has uh, has done it wrong once and didn't like having to deal with that. So I like that. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Huh. Yeah. Apple ID, has that always been there? Uh, it hasn't. Yeah. So that your Apple ID that's linked to your account is also listed there. That hasn't always been there, but it's been there for a long time. Several OS versions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then aliases. Is that, um, what are the aliases here? I don't have any set. <laughs> Do I? I think I did on the other. What's I have. Is that the a alias user? Uh, yeah. Th so that's interesting. There is. Um, an alias for mine is, is my, um, my Apple ID. And then there's some other Apple ID that looks to be a serial number, hopefully of mine and not one of you folks logging in. And then, yeah, you could set up another alias. I don't, I don't know what these aliases are for. If you know, let us know. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I'm not sure if I heard you right. I think you said feedback. At MacGeekGab.com. I did. It was feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That's, uh, that's how we roll here, man. It's good. Oh, what else do we have? What else do we have, John? Um, yeah. All right. We can. Yeah. We got some time here, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Michael asks, he says, uh, I just got a new Western Digital external drive that I wanted to format uh, to... APFS and after starting disk utility, I got the message media kit reports, not enough space on device for requested operation. I dug around and saw that it's an issue with APFS. I didn't deep to dig too deep into the cause and figured you may know more. I don't think I've heard you mention this on the show. So I thought I'd share and perhaps you could discuss and, uh, and yeah, it, it, Looks like there's an article that that actually Michael sent to us, uh, but you'll you'll also find if you simply search for that error that the way those containers are set up now with APFS on the disks means that the sort of the core partition has to be 
larger than it used to be or the, the core, I don't even know the right way to say it. Um, uh, like, like the, 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 the container manager or the main containers, I don't know. Anyway, you have to go and wipe out, you have to go in into the terminal, use disk util and wipe out everything on that disk so that it can create a larger, um, uh, what are they? I'm trying to think of what they call it. the EFI partition. That's it. The EFI partition is too small in, in these cases. It it's generally, you know, like a hundred megs and it needs to be 200 megs for, um, for the way APFS needs to put data out there. It's just not big enough. And a lot of these third party drives come with, EFI partitions that were built for windows. And those are like, you know, 134 megs, anything lower than 200, not enough. So that's the issue. And it's not that bad. Um, obviously you want to do this before you put any data out there because that, you know, you're going to lose all that data when you change the partition type anyway, but then just be careful when you go through these steps, not to wipe out the wrong drive, but otherwise. Good to go. So, did you check in? The, did you check that out, John? Uh-oh. Um, oh. Okay, you're here. Good. No, no, we're here. Yeah, not enough. I wonder if that's what I ran into. Huh. Oh no, I can't imagine. I mean, this was you had an AP an HFS plus drive that was migrated to APFS, right? Yes. So that, uh, in theory, that shouldn't happen. But I mean, you know. We know how theories go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, right. yeah. Um, yeah. Let's go to this. Let's, let's see where we get with Mark here. So, um, Mark says, I've got a parenting Mac geek challenge for you. I have a friend with a 14 year old son who is technically advanced. They, on the other hand, are not. They put parental controls on his account as he's a special needs child and they want to reduce his use of the internet, but the kid is smart enough to social engineer his mom into unlocking his account and such <laughs> this time. He figured out if he gets into recovery mode, he's got unfettered access to Safari. Any thoughts on how to help a technically challenged person wage the parental control battle? Um, I've always wondered about this, um, you know, because my kids are really good at understanding and circumventing stuff. Right. And as all kids are because they're, you know, kids now are, you know, the I generation, right. Or the Google generation, they understand that other people have likely solved the problem that they are having. And all you got to do is Google for it. And somebody will tell you what to do to work around any sort of parental controls or any other problem you have. I mean, that's the beauty of it, right? That's what we do here. We help solve problems. Um, so while my kids are comfortable implementing, you know, untested solutions, uh, at least I am able to grok what they're doing and can just call them out on it. So like, if I see, you know, we use open, we don't, our parenting style, everybody comes up with their own parenting style to, to make it through, right? That's just what you do. And you make it up as you go along. And, and our style has evolved into one where we talk about everything at anywhere, but mostly at the dinner table. Right. And, and I always tell, you know, innocent bystanders beware because our dinner table conversations can get, you know, for some people weird and uncomfortable. Um, but, um, and we, so we, we don't do a whole lot of limiting in, in, from a technological sense here, because I simply know that the kids can get around it. Um, we do use open DNS and block like obvious porn sites and like other weird things and, and that, but that's, more a network protection thing than it is a parenting thing. If I'm being perfectly honest, um, I, you know, but because I know if I look at one of my kids devices and I see that they've put, you know, eight, 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 eight in is their as their DNS server. I know exactly why they've done that. Right. It's to get around per, per, to get a per, per, per performance. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's Our network performs fun. really well, man. My yeah, kids yeah. don't have any problems with performance with the network. So I know like why that's going to happen. And, and like I said, I can call them out on it and then we can talk about it at the dinner table. Um, and, and things get, you know, interesting, but, um, 
and we embarrass each other. They do it to me. I do it to them. It's, it's fine. Um, but like I said, we're, you know, not everybody is the same. And that certainly means that not everybody's like us. And um, I also understand that every kid is different. And that's certainly true, you know, for a child who is, uh, you know, labeled or uh, called special needs. Um, so talking and communicating can mean very different things with different kids. You know, if your kid's not able to be uh, articulate and and understanding, well, then, that, you know, that obviously just presents a, a challenge that means you need to walk a different parenting path. And so for a technical solution, like there's nothing that's going to be totally foolproof. But my first thought is to get a router that allows you to set network wide parental controls and perhaps even tells you when a device is trying to hit something that you've blocked so that uh, you can go and talk to the kid, right? Like if, if, um, if, if I see that one of my kids has, has changed their DNS to 8888 or whatever, um, I don't know, like, I, I don't, we don't, we don't monitor things like that. So I don't know why they did that or when they did that, but you certainly could. And then it would be like, all right, I see that you've worked around this. I know what you were trying to get to. Let's talk about why, like, that's maybe something that it's not good for you or, or whatever. Right. You know, um, so having that data might be really helpful, even though, you know, going in that the kid could circumvent it, you might get some level of like, oh, they hit that wall and then they stopped hitting that wall. I wonder why um, they've circumvented it. But at least, you know, they hit the wall the first time. So that could be really helpful is um, is getting some level of of, you know, a router that that has not just parental controls, but reporting in it. And, and there's, there's a lot of these things like the, you know, the Disney circle thing is built into a lot of routers now and and that's pretty good, but some router vendors have just built their own things in and, and they work really, really well. Just be aware that, you know, like changing a DNS server, like I just said, or installing a VPN client on their device will completely uh, obscure anything that they're doing uh, from other than you'll see they're connecting to a VPN and then that's, then you know, nothing else. So like, there's no magic answer, but maybe something here helped. I don't know. What do you think, John? One thing I think this will prevent, um, there's something we haven't talked about, talked about in a while. and does increase the security of your system a bit here, but I wonder if setting a firmware password. Oh yeah. Okay. Cause setting a firmware password, I think that's the proper term. It, 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 they yep. changed what they call it. But from what I recall, it prevents you from using most startup key combinations like Command R, which is going recovery into recovery. Mode. Oh yeah. So you could do that and not give him. Well, it sounds like he's already able to, as we heard, social engineer. So he'll probably just social engineer that one out. <laughs> right, right. But at least, I mean, like e e even in that case, right? His mother knew that he was so knew that he had in, at least in retrospect, social engineer. So, okay. All right, great. You know, I mean, every, it's not, there's no one, you know, clear parenting method or answer like, okay, she's aware she got, you know, she got duped. Okay, great. Now let's, you know, think about that kind of stuff. The more knowledge you have, the less chances you are, you're going to be duped about that same thing again, at least. Wow. So. Right. But yeah, the, no, uh, that's a good one. The, I like that. Yeah. The other thought is I'm going to find out shortly if uh, making it a managed device would um, prevent shenanigans as well. Oh, and I'm yeah. actually, uh, well, the thing is I'm actually looking into, and I think, um, so, you know, Jamf is one. But, right. Um, right. And uh, know, they're has, not a specific sponsor of this episode, but I'm, I guarantee you that code still works because we just said it last week. Jamf.com slash MGG gets you your first device. And I devices believe for free. you may be able to, um, I think you can do some level of, uh, you know, uh, configuration and, and restriction by using a product like that. Yeah. The other one, which we'll find out shortly, Dave, is um, I'm currently, uh, so I've been asked to uh, summarize some of the, uh, some of the things that I learned once I learned that Mac OS, uh, Mac OS server can actually do, I guess what we call MDM, right? I guess Mobile device management. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so actually, what's interesting about, um, well, no, I think both products do this. So whether you're using Jamf or, or Mac OS Server, uh, it's not just uh, it's not just mobile devices, actually. Well, it could be, but it may not be. It right. Had, um, like, I, I was actually kind of surprised with the uh, Apples that um, you can create a profile for a Mac. Like, oh, huh? totally. You can do it with Jamf, too. Yeah. Yeah, whereas I was led to believe because, you know, these products are similar to Apple Configurator, but as far as I know, Apple Configurator is only iOS devices. Or maybe it is Macs. We'll see. But, I don't um, know. I've never, yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time with Apple Configurator, but that's only um, devices that you can, you can, that's local management, right? Not m- remote management. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a per, yeah, you got to have the device in front of you. Right, There's right, no, yes. You know, distributed or, you know, you can't do things like, uh, you know, push a profile over the internet, which is another thing server can do if you got push services, and I would assume Jamf has some, well, that, some... That's what Jamf does, right? I mean, there is no local management. It's all just m- remote. So you, it's all push services. Yeah. So it's some sort of a... Okay, so they have... And Jamf, Jamf's not the only services. one, right? There's there's a Meraki out there. Jamf is probably the, the easiest one for like a, a, a non... Like a, a home user to use. But there's Meraki out there. There's a Monkey, I think is what it's called. M U N K. E uh, there's there's lots of them yeah 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 so okay and yeah to, to confirm here so um Apple Configurator only supports iPhone iPad iPod and Apple TV devices okay so, okay so if you want to tweak those that's uh that's a good one too yeah 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 or just have a talk. Well, I mean, I think it's a lot like of things. Said. It's yeah. There's no magic answer, right? You know, you just you, like I said, you make it up as you go along. You hope you don't screw your kids up too much. That's all. I try to make a list. I told my kids, I've, I, I I mean, I've been telling them this for years, and I'm making a list that um, that I'll sell to their therapist. Uh, you know, when they're like thirty or whatever, of all the things that I know of that I did that that might have screwed them up, and you know, their therapist might get some mileage out of that. Um, and then my daughter, when, you know, I started telling my kids this when they were like eight or something, which, and of course, even telling them that I was making the list is probably one of the things that should be on the list. Um, and my daughter told me, you know, daddy, she was like eight or 10 or something. She's like, I'm making a list too. And I said, Oh, she said, yeah. Of all the things that, um, that my brother and I get away with that you don't know about. And I'll give that to you too someday. Like, yeah, Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Back to the, um, yeah, we're going to just do these two because they're good questions. Um, really one of them is sort of a geek challenge, even though it, I, I should know this answer. So Stevie asked, um, do you have any suggestions for a FileMaker training program? I'm, I'm a beginner. However, I would like to create uh, an uh, MIS for my family business. Thanks for any suggestions. So yeah, FileMaker is pretty awesome. I happened to mention it earlier in this episode that we, you know, have managed our businesses on it for 20 years and we keep looking at maybe we should change to this or that or this other thing that's like a pre-built solution. It's like, eh, no, thanks. Like what we've got here is better. Um, starting from scratch is tough. I would really recommend starting from a template and FileMaker's got some resources at filemaker.com slash custom dash apps, uh, that we'll link to here. And, uh, that's not a bad place to start. I also found filemaker examples.co.uk, uh, are places to start with examples, uh, there are classes, uh, there's Linda classes and, you know, all of those things too. But, um, but starting with a template and, and understanding sort of how that's doing things can be a really handy way to sort of get your feet wet with, uh, with FileMaker because starting truly from scratch, I guess I've done it. Um, our, the database we, we use to manage all our Mac observer contacts. I made that totally from scratch on a train ride, actually down to see you one day, many years ago. But, um, but uh, you know, that was after a decade plus of, of using FileMaker all the time. And so it was, and it's a pretty simple database anyway. So, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily start with a blank slate, but 
taking a template uh, for something that does something similar and then, you know, just learning to modify it or modifying it as you go. Like, oh, we don't need this. All right, take it out. But it would be cool if we did that. All right, let's look. And you can search online and take some classes or that kind of thing. But if you folks have, a, a, you know, something more concrete and specific than what I'm sharing here, by all means, let us know and we will pass it along to Stevie. Right? Yeah. I mean, a place to look also. So, uh, you know, unless you really live in the sticks here, I mean, even my town has, uh, they call it Fairfield uh, Continuing Education. So uh, your town or your library, or uh, if you have um, a school in your town, which oh, most yeah. do, they may offer some, uh, they may offer some training, maybe able to even get credit for it. Very, very true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I saw it. I, I looked through ours once and, you know, they had photography courses uh, that this is our pub, you know, our uh, continuing education yeah. they had photography and they actually had like how to get started on Mac, how to get started with windows. And I think I even did see how to get started with FileMaker. Cool. Cool. So, or you could get a computer science degree and take database design. <laughs> yeah. That's still not going to, I mean, it's going to give you some of the foundations <laughs> that would help you understand what you're doing in FileMaker, but it's still not going to teach you how to use FileMaker. Like, it, no. you, like every, every tool is specific. Yeah. All right. I know we're, we're going a little late here, but I, I do want to get this next one out. So Chris uh, over in the UK writes, Going back to the, we must have three copies of a file to consider ourselves covered for backup. I'm struggling with this now that I'm using iCloud for all my data, especially as my new MacBook Pro doesn't have enough internal storage. I'm using the optimized Mac storage option. I don't have many of the originals of my files and pictures to allow me to back them up. Suggestions, please, in this new era of cloud computing. Yeah, so this is like it, sort of what I was talking about with that client earlier with, with their iCloud library, not, not putting them all on the, you know, in the same account, but having that one computer that could download all of them and then backing up from there, they happened to have that computer, right? Um, not all of us are that fortunate. So in, in this case, you know, it, it, it's a very real problem that you don't have enough storage on any of your devices to hold it all. And therefore from there, you can't back it all up. Um, one way to do it would be to create, and this starts getting a little dicey, but like this whole episode has all the skills that you would need to get there. Um, create a second user account on your Mac and then change that user accounts, home directory to an external drive. Okay. And make sure that external drive, of course, has the storage that that or has enough space to store all the things from both your iCloud drive. I assume that's what you're talking about here. And also your iCloud photo library. Photo library, you can actually point to any drive you want. Your home directory, um, you have to sort of go through the machinations that we talked about earlier in terms of changing that. But we did. So you can make it happen. Um, and then once you do that, you only need to have that external drive connected when you log into that separate account. So you don't need to bring it with you all the time. Like when you're going out to the, you know, like the library or, you know, coffee shop or traveling or whatever, come home, you log in, you know, you connect the drive first, you log in to that account and then let iCloud drive and iCloud photo library sync everything down to that drive. And then you can back that drive up too. Now you've got your cloud copy. That's always there. You've got, well, hopefully always there. Then you've got your local copy and then you can back up your local copy. And now you're starting to get to a point where you've, you've got, you know, lots of data. We haven't heard of anyone losing data in iCloud drive or, or app. We haven't heard of Apple losing people's data in iCloud drive or iCloud photo library. Um, my guess is we never will, but that doesn't mean we should assume anything. So I, I, that's my thoughts. What do you think, John? I'm with you. The number is three. The number is three, at least minimum, right? Minimum of three. That's how I go. Yeah. It does pain me though. When, when I hear these tales of one, not having enough, uh, not anticipating their needs right? Uh, upon purchase. And, and of course now Apple makes it difficult, if not impossible to change that. Well, like Chris says, I mean, it, we are in this world where, like our computers 
the, the the idea is that our computers don't have to store all of our data. We can leverage the cloud to do that. And when I say computers, I don't just mean our iMacs and our, our MacBooks. I mean our iPads and our iPhones too. We are very much running cloud linked devices. Um, but I certainly like to know that if the cloud screws up, I have a copy of the data that's important to me. And so like there is that, that's the, to me, that's the workaround. So, you know, yeah. All right. Well, John, I think it's time. We got to bring the band in. I think it's too snowy out there to leave them out there too long. Oh, you got snow. Which is well, it was, yeah, it was like slushy, snowy. Yeah, yeah ex- exactly. That's, yes. Yeah. That's actually sometimes worse than, um, yeah, snowfall. Because, uh, yeah, well, one, like, they typically don't clean it up, and uh, and they can do interesting things with the direction that your uh, vehicle travels in. Sometimes, at least that's been my experience. <laughs> yes, I've been I've been texting my son during the show because he had to uh, drive. This was his first adventure driving in any you know snowy, sleety weather. We his it's first year driving, and so he, we don't uh, you know we kind of made a policy that yeah, just skip the snow this year. Get your Get some really? experience. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, like I, I did that when I started driving too. It's great. Like, don't you, you got enough to think about your first year on the road? Don't add snow. You you just need experience to know how to deal with emergency scenarios. Like that, it's you have oh, to make it through them. Right, that's the only way. If they don't, oh, kill I did you, that, and I remember. Oh, this was terrifying. Um, for the for the instructor, but I actually took driver's ed in high school. Sure. And, um, one of the uh, lessons was emergency procedures. Mm-hmm. I think my favorite was where he put the clipboard in front of you to simulate your hood flying up, and then you, you had to decelerate the vehicle. I'm saying that this guy must have aged at an incredible rate because, I mean, he's... Yeah. Or what else did he do? He did another one where he would slam on the gas to pretend you had a stuck accelerator, oh, yeah? and the proper response was to turn off the engine. Right. Um but yeah, having the guy jam on uh, all of a sudden accelerating at a, at a crazy. <laughs> I don't think they do oh, that so fun. in driver's ed anymore. But they do do that when you're getting your pilot's license still for your you know small crafts and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I go to a parking lot and get some practice. I think that's what my dad well, did with me. That, that's right. Yeah, but it's just experience. So anyway, this was his first oh, yeah. morning, uh, or first time having to kind of deal with that. And um, you know, I said, look, if you're not comfortable, just text me. I can pause the show and come get you. It's totally fine. It, you know, but he was like, no, it, it, it's a short drive home. And uh, he took it slow and didn't want to back it into the garage after we got home. But was well, like, he's, a, right, he's already okay. experienced in uh, ice uh, maneuvering yeah, it's uh, true. <laughs> uh, himself on ice. Yeah, that kid, man, it's really amazing. Being, especially being on the ice with him. Like, he is just so comfortable on skates. It's ridiculous. It's like, it's for him, it's no different than walking. But anyway, all right. Um, where are we here? We told you about the the main email address. Uh for those of you that are premium subscribers, premium at MacGeekUp.com. For those of you that aren't but are interested in becoming one, MacGeekUp.com slash premium is the place to go. And uh, it looks like, if I if my phone is telling me the right thing, it looks like, uh, oh, I can't tell the person's name here, but it looks like somebody signed up new during the episode. So thank you to, uh, I don't want to read your email address on the air, and I can't tell what your name was. So I'm just going to, we'll say it next week. There you go. Uh, that's premium at MacGeekGab.com. Any one of you can call us at 224-888-GEEK, which John is? Four, three, three, five. Where else can they find us, John? Uh, well, they could find our various musings and, and little nuggets of wisdom and ranting and raving and all that um, on the Twitters. I am John F. Braun. He is Dave Hamilton. The podcast is MacGeekGab. The publication is Mac Observer, and that other guy, Pilot Pete. So that's uh, that should be enough Twitter for you. Yeah, that's it's that's a lot of Twitter. Uh, I want to make sure we thank Cashfly C A C H E F L Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Of course, our sponsors, Otherworld Computing, and the uh, podcast marketplace here at MacSales dot com. Smile at SmileSoftware dot com slash podcast. Barebones software with 64-bit BB edited. Barebones.com. And, of course, RoboForm.com. 
or coupon code MGG saves you some money on your subscription there. All right, folks, have a great week. We will see you next week. And as I said earlier in the episode, do your best to make sure you don't get caught. Made up.